Welcome and happy Mother's Day to everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Dean Lee and I am Professor of Physics at the Facility for Rare Isotope Beams or FRIB. Today's public talk is part of an initiative at FRIB called the Advanced Studies Gateway. The goal of the Advanced Studies Gateway is to inspire people. We bring together researchers, innovators, creative thinkers, artists, and performers from all fields and strengthen ties between Michigan State University and the community. Today, we have the pleasure of presenting a public lecture by Professor Melissa Franklin entitled, The Time It Takes, My First Role Model and How She and I Are Both Interested in Measuring the Time Things Take to Happen. Professor Franklin is an experimental particle physicist who studies proton-proton collisions produced by the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC. She is a collaborator on the ATLAS experiment at the LHC, where she works in collaboration with over 3,000 physicists. Professor Franklin was co-discoverer of the top quark and the Higgs boson. She is presently studying the properties of the Higgs boson and searching for new physics beyond the standard model. Born and raised in Canada, she received her bachelor of science degree from the University of Toronto and her PhD from Stanford University. She worked as a postdoctoral fellow at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. She was an assistant professor at the University of Illinois and a junior fellow in the Society of Fellows at Harvard before joining the Harvard faculty in 1989. In 1992, she became the first woman to receive tenure in the physics department and served as chair of the physics department at Harvard from 2010 to 2014. If you have any questions during this talk, please type them into the chat or question and dial answer dialog box. At this time, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Franklin. Hi. Hi, everybody, and thank you for um, joining in on Mother's Day. Um, and for all the mothers there, happy Mother's Day. And for all the people who had mothers, which is <clears throat> many, um, <laughs> then, uh, happy Mother's Day, too. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about um, the time it takes. I'm very interested in uh, asking questions about how long things take. Um, and I am also going to highlight um, a woman who won the Nobel Prize uh, for physics, but who nobody really knows about. And she became my role model. Here on the first slide um, is me on the left in the cowboy outfit, <laughs> and she's on the right. And you can tell we're different. I'm an experimentalist and she was a theorist. So the other thing is she was very interested in uh, the time things take for things like atoms to do things. And I'm very interested in the time elementary particles take. <clears throat> so, uh, so um, I was going to start with uh, talking about another woman, but she was going to be my role model. She was really interesting. She was a person named Ernest Rutherford's first graduate student at McGill. And Rutherford was the one who figured out that there was a, a, a nucleus in an atom. And she was the one that figured out what radon was. Radon is the thing that you don't want in your basement if you're going to sit there for a long time. Uh, and she had a very, very interesting life and went all over the world doing physics, but she never got a PhD. And um, she got married and died. So, um, <laughs> so she couldn't be my total role model, although almost. Um, <clears throat> so what happened and why I'm talking about Maria Gabbert Mayer is because a friend of mine um, asked me to give an inaugural lecture at the University of Chicago, where Maria Gabbert Mayer did a lot of her work, although not being paid by Chicago, but she was at Chicago. Um, and uh, I didn't know what to talk about at this lecture. Um, and my host said, you know, you can talk about anything you want to. It doesn't have to be anything to do with her. But what happened was I went down the rabbit hole and the rabbit hole was Maria Gepper Mayer. So I read everything I could about her and her articles. And I decided that I would um, give a talk about Maria Gepper Mayer. And then that's when I sort of fell in love. Um, 
And let's see, this sometimes works and sometimes doesn't, this thing. Okay. Um, okay. So let me tell you why I fell in love. And you're going to think it's a little bit odd, but that's okay because I'm absolutely a little bit odd. So at some point, Maria Gepert Merritt, and this is later, so this is why I got interested. She was uh, teaching. She was a professor at Sarah Lawrence College, which is a, a place outside New York. And this was the faculty meeting. And you can see all these women at the faculty meeting. And then I immediately looked at their legs. And you can see that all of the women to the right are cross their legs and have sensible shoes. And then perhaps you can't see well. Here, <laughs> we have Maria Gepert Mayer who has not crossed her legs and who's wearing loafers and her feet are on the trestle. This immediately, I thought I could tell just by their feet um, that this is an interesting person. And you may think that I'm insane and that's possible, but here she is and here you can see clearly uh, in her later life, she was a chain smoker and a, and a hard drinker and an incredible uh, theoretical physicist. And there is something about her intensity um, that I was very much drawn to. I don't know if you, rem you know, if you think about intense intellectual women, um, and in this case, they all, they all happen to be smoking, but if you just imagine that they were not smoking, um, we have Susan Sontag, who is a public intellectual, and Marguerite Yorsenar, who is a great uh, writer, and Chantal Ackerman, who is a great filmmaker. And there's something about intensity that draws uh, both intellectuals and physicists. There's something about the intensity of finding something out about the universe, you know, working night and day in order to get somewhere um, to see something new. And this is the intensity that I think many of us are drawn to, and certainly I am. So who was this Maria Gepert Mayer? So she was um, a person who grew up in, in Germany and she uh, decided to go to, to university in mathematics and in a place called Göttingen. Um, and it was a very, it was a place during the time she was there in the 1920s and 30s um, where everybody was there. But she started in mathematics and then she switched to uh, physics. And if you look at just this list of names here, you, you know, I'm sure people will uh, recognize Fermi um, and possibly just Fermi. <laughs> Von Neumann, Oppenheimer, of course, all these people were at um, Göttingen or passed through. So it was an incredible intellectual place. Her math teacher was a woman called Emmy Nuther, and she is herself very, very, I'm going to mention her. Uh, she was an incredible um, mathematician who changed how physics was done. Um, so here is a picture of Maria Gephardt Mayer with her thesis advisor. Now, now, nowadays we're not allowed to go bathing with our thesis advisors, <laughs> but um, but here is Max Born. Max Born uh, was her thesis advisor, and he won the Nobel Prize as well, uh, along with many, many, many of these people. Um, so uh, let me just make an aside to Emmy Nuther because she did change the course of both mathematics and physics. And uh, and recently, I went to a one-woman play about her, and um, it was a really terrible play, um, not because the actress was bad or the director was bad. It was because they didn't have enough to go on, because, in fact, she never wrote. She wrote a lot of mathematical theorems, but she didn't write a lot of uh, anything else. And so, in fact, I'm starting a course um, at Harvard where all the science students have to write every day uh, so that... Um, we can make sure that if they do anything brilliant then, uh, when they die, we can read something about what they said. There was a man, he's a, also a very famous mathematician, who, Herman Weil, who uh, wrote eulogies for many of the people who died before him. And um, what he wrote was that he admired her greatly as a mathematician. Um, and he said uh, in his book, um, being with her was like being with a warm loaf of bread, which is sort of what we have left from the from descriptions, um, which is on the one hand nice if it's winter, but in the summer may not be so great. Um, 
So here she was, uh, Marie Gepper Mayer. She was a person who she, um, she got her PhD at Göttingen and she started her uh, career as a physicist. And then she fell in love with a, a tall American man named Mayer. And they came to the United States before the Second World War. <clears throat> and she then followed him around um, and tried to do physics wherever she could. And she could. That was quite Im impressive that independent of whether she had a job or not, someone would always let her sit in the lab and then she would do her work and talk to all the theorists um, who were there. Um, she, I will show you three of the things she did, which are all about measuring time. Um, just before she won the Nobel Prize, there was a famous uh, historian and philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, uh, famous for writing something called The Structure of the Scientific Revolution, which many people read a long time ago, but maybe not necessary to read now because I think it's been superseded with other um, theories. Um, he interviews Marie in 1962. She wins the Nobel Prize in 1963, but he only asks about all those people at Göttingen and what she knew about them, um, which is which I, I am so sad about because I would really like to have known what she thought about things. Um, so one thing she, she did say, uh, she did say when she was interviewed by Thomas Kuhn was about this uh, mathematician, grand mathematician at Göttingen called Hilbert, David Hilbert, who uh, had a house just down the hill from her parents' house. Her father was a professor as well. And when she passed his house, uh, she said this, he had a large garden. In the garden, there was a blackboard, the whole length of the garden with a roof over it. So even in the rain, you could be out. And he would walk with his assistants up and down. And whenever they wanted to do something on the blackboard, there was a blackboard. It was a very long garden. Um, in his last years, he gave his lectures at home. So this is the kind of thing you, you're very interested in reading about. And also it was interesting because Thomas Kuhn interviewed her, but she had written this book, um, The Elementary Theory of Nuclear Shelf Structure, uh, and he didn't ask her about that. But if you want to read the book, um, it's physics. So here she is um, uh, getting the Nobel Prize in 1963. And unfortunately, she um, she had before that had a stroke. Uh, but I like what she is. Uh, apparently, she said when she said she had to go to the, the Nobel ceremony is, um, is it possible to smoke? Do I have to go the whole time without smoking? <laughs> and that was the thing that upset her most. So I, that may, it uh, makes you like her even more, even though, of course, we don't like smoking. Smoking is bad. Um, so here's the thing, when uh, there's many people, physicists who deal with matter, and they're actually pretty interesting. Uh, they they uh, try and figure out what's happening inside ma all kinds of different matter. And then uh, there's atoms and there's uh, sort of lattices of atoms and people think about those. And um, then there's sort of the atom itself. And that was sort of Maria's place. She was very interested in how atoms decay and um, and why they're still around. And then me, I'm over here. I'm, if you look inside the atom, if you look inside this uh, nucleus here, you'll find some quarks. And if you look at these funny electrons around here, those are the things that I'm interested in. So um, uh, I'm interested in the uh, elementary particles and the elementary forces, and she was in, interested in the atomic forces. So the first, uh, one of the first things she did after her um, thesis, PhD thesis was she uh, worked on something which was just then being um, uh, it was new. We realized that neutrons, things inside the uh, nucleus, decayed to protons, the other things inside the nucleus. And when they did, um, they uh, an electron would come out. Um, so you would have a neutron going in here and an electron would come out, a proton would come out, and there was something missing. There was some these con conservation laws that uh, Emmy Nether led us to that said, oh, there's something missing. There's got to be a new particle. This was when people first said neutrino. And this is a kind of decay 
um, which takes about 17 minutes. So the neutron can decay to the proton, but it takes a long time. And she was very interested in the question, well, could there be an atom where there's two beta disintegrations at the same time? It was her first calculation. And you see here that she, she wrote most of her papers by herself, which is, um, which is something I've never done. So that's another reason that she's my, she's my uh, idol. Um, so she did make this calculation and she, she was, you know, you, you don't, there's a lot of neutrons around and a lot of atoms. So you, this makes a difference. So, uh, but she found that it, the half life of this, um, this happening is about 10 to the 17th years or a really, really long time. Um, but let me just say, you know, let's just talk because I'm going to talk about lifetime. The lifetime of an ele elementary particle is a random thing. So elementary particles, if you start with 100 and you ask what happens, you know, as a function of time, in the, so that here the x-axis is time, um, it looks like there's this exponential curve. So you start out with 100 and exponentially it goes down. So uh, the number of particles goes down and you can you can give a kind of mean lifetime they you know some decay very quickly some decay a long time after just sort of just like flipping a coin but humans are different you know we we're born and then maybe some people don't survive but then we don't we don't have an exponential decay it would not be good if, if humans decayed exponentially we have a clock inside so it's it's uh it's something more like this and so if this is the number of humans as a function of, of their age, this is, I, I made this plot up just so you know, it's not actually, I couldn't find it anywhere. No one had made this plot, but I think it must look something like that. So uh, when we talk about the lifetime of a particle, we're talking about the average lifetime. And it, when the particle has a lifetime, it doesn't mean that that particle always decays at exactly that time, um, which, which makes me think I should turn on my, my, my clock. Okay, uh, so just to just to uh, set the stage, elementary particles have something called a mass, a characteristic mass. It's the same all the time, and they have a lifetime. And so a particle will be uh, traveling along with a mass and a lifetime, and then it will what we call decay. But what it really means is a particle A will transform into a particle B plus C. And we can measure that lifetime. And we can also measure the mass uh, by looking at the momentum and energy of B and C. So we're very interested in characterizing how many particles there are and how different they are. And we characterize them by their mass and their lifetime. So this is a funny thing. When Maria Gebert Mayer first um, calculated to neutron decays, two beta decays. This is Feynman's way of looking at it, starting with a um, neutrons on the left and protons. I know they're made up of quarks on the right. And, and that's what this is. Maria calculated this. But very, very quickly after that, people said, well, if that can happen, so with Feynman diagrams, anything that is not forbidden can happen. So they said, if this can happen, then this thing can happen where in fact, you don't have any neutrinos coming out here. You just have electrons coming out. And this can happen in the special case where the neutrino is its own antiparticle. So that was kind of cool. And in fact, the, it went like this. It was first hey, 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 beta decay. Yeah. Melissa, I, I think you might be touching your microphone or something. There's, there's a little bit of, of noise. Uh, uh, yeah. OK. Maybe I get rid of my microphone then. How about that? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. That, that Is that better? Good. Yeah, that sounds better. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Sorry. I heard it too, but I don't know what it is. Um, okay. So uh, so there's neutrino. Uh, we didn't know what it was. And then there was this guy, Majorana, um, who suggested that the neutrino could be its own antiparticle. Majorana was himself um, a famous guy, and he was working with Fermi, and he was from Sicily. And one day he went to Sicily, and then he decided to come back to Rome. 
and he got on the ferry and um, he never got off. That was the end of my Rana. So it's a, quite a mystery. But okay, so Pauli introduced the neutrino in 1930. Fermi came up with beta decay in 33. Geppert Mayer met, uh, calculates double beta decay. Majorana in 37 said maybe the neutrino is its own antiparticle. We haven't even we haven't even ever made a neutrino at this point. And then Furry at Harvard in 1939 said, oh, maybe there could be a neutrino unless double beta decay. Why do I tell you all this? Because it's also about how long things take. Right now, I, I guess it's almost 90 years later or 85 years later, there are still 10 experiments looking for neutrinos double beta decay. And the intensity of interest grows with time. So it takes on the, something like 100 years sometimes for things to come about. So um, Maria was always asking why certain elements had a long lifetime. And this is kind of an important thing for um, the rare isotope <laughs> uh, laboratory. Um, again, uh, she was very interested, and I'll show you what she was interested in. We have this plot of all the isotopes. And the isotope is like an atom with a different number of neutrons. So you have all kinds of different atoms. So here are the number of protons in this uh, going up here, and the number of neutrons on the x-axis. And you can sort of look at each of these boxes is an isotope with a lifetime. So you can you can see how experimentalists had to be pretty um, industrious <laughs> to measure all these things. And first of all, a lot of these isotopes you aren't, don't exist in nature, so you have to make them first. It's something like a rare isotope laboratory, or I'm guessing. Anyhow, these black ones here were very stable. And that is, they took a very, very long time to decay or they didn't decay at all. And the question was why? So Maria was really thinking why did these different isotopes take a different amount of time to decay? And this was a quantum mechanical problem. Um, and these were these isotopes were called the magic numbers of nucleons. And she figured this out, for which she got the Nobel Prize. And um, and she figured it out. Of course, she wrote the paper by herself. But at the same time, there was someone in Germany who wrote a similar paper. But at Chicago at the time, there were a lot of interesting people. And so she was regularly talking to Fermi, for instance. Um, and that's the kind of thing that makes this possible, that makes uh, people have um, breakthroughs. So another thing is that she was best friends with Edward Teller. Edward Teller was um, the father of the hydrogen bomb. And he was sort of what people think the, 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 the crazy scientist character in Dr. Strangelove uh, is, is uh, modeled after. Uh, he was a Hungarian physicist who, like Maria, um, came over before the war um, to America. And there were many, many, many emigres uh, from, uh, obviously, from Göttingen also. Uh, all the Jewish uh, physicists came out. And, um, and they were very good friends and they, uh, wrote a paper, which is really interesting, again, um, asking uh, how long things last. So this is a one in which it's called on the origin of the elements. And they just said, okay, if you just look at the crust of the earth, so you just take some dirt or some rock, or whatever, and you ask, uh, what is the abundance of each element? Um, or, you, you know, you take some uh, just around the earth, then you have here on the on the on the x-axis, you have z is the number of protons in the element, and the abundance here uh, is not linear. It's 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 a log. So for every one of these boxes, it goes up by a factor of ten. So you say, okay, there's a lot of hydrogen and helium. We all know that. But what do we what do, what they did was they looked at this plot and they looked at iron. Iron is right here, and they said, what is happening after iron? It seems to go nickel cobalt, copper, it seems to, this is a log cluster, it drops precipitously and then it sort of flattens out. And so they said, well, what, what's going on? How, how does, why is that true? Why, why are there some, lots of some elements and not others? And if you look now at the periodic table, uh, you can have a version where 
the periodic tel table tells you where for the elements on the earth, where are they coming from? Where can they be made? So for instance, um, the ones in purple can only be made if you have merging neutron stars. They can't be made in the Big Bang. They can't be made in dying low mass stars or exploding massive stars uh, or cosmic rays, but they can be made in neutron stars, which is kind of interesting because you know neutron stars um, are these dense uh, stars which don't merge that often. <laughs> so you take something like gold in the earth and you ask, you know, where does it come from? And then you imagine that it's coming from the collisions of neutron stars. And you think, oh yeah, sure, whatever. And then, <laughs> and then actually we were able to see a neutron star collision with a experiment called LIGO, um, uh, which is looking at gravity waves and it can see when, when two neutron stars collide, a lot of gravity waves come out. And they were able to see this collision, um, which is incredibly beautiful, um, so just a few years ago, well, maybe five, six years ago. And astronomers immediately looked at the same time to see what they could see in the spectroscopy of, the star, of these neutron star collisions. And they saw gold and um, uranium, etc. So they actually were, were able to see this come true. Um, and you think about gold and you think, well, what exactly, how exactly do we have gold on the earth? Uh, you know, it's the first time I had thought about it. And it's such a lovely story because somehow neutron stars have to somehow somewhere near the earth, no, near, near what will become the earth, Neutron stars collide, then there's gold dust in the world. And then there's, there's different um, hy hypotheses about exactly how it happened. But somehow there's gold dust. And somehow by gravity, the earth is formed. And that gold dust is inside. And then, um, uh, you know, we have different ideas, either maybe the gold dust is in chunks, and maybe it's just not. But the earth forms. It's interesting that we don't know exactly how it forms yet. And then we have people, uh, then we have the, this gold swirling in the, in the center of the earth. Um, and somehow, because it's the same mass, somehow uh, coming together. And then we have people, um, these are all people mining for gold in, in Brazil. I just thought this was a beautiful picture. Um, and then, of course, you wear it um, later. So this story of, this story of gold makes you connect uh, something like neutron star collisions and something gravity waves and things that you can't imagine with with the gold that we know is somehow connected with our economy. Anyway, I think it's a nice story. Um, uh, so I just wanted to also say that I I got very interested in Maria Gepert Mayer. I went out to uh, San Diego, UC San Diego, where she spent the last seven years of her life. And um, there she has her archives. And I've, uh, I'm not a historian, but I went there into the archive room and they bring you these boxes of things. And a couple of the boxes were something like 250 letters from, um, uh, from Teller, from Edward Teller to Marie Gepard Mayer. And, um, and the way they, uh, I read the letters, but the way they class, the way they show you the letters is the, by the first sentence. And I thought it's very interesting that by a first sentence you can imagine quite a lot. Um, uh, for instance, I am most consciously practicing the art of being lazy. Um, uh, it is a, it's a year since I wrote to you, since last century, since I heard from you. This is sort of. Um, Interesting. It was interesting to me, and I um, I read these letters, and I thought, oh, uh, there's got to be some letters from Maria to Edward. So this will be interesting. I'll get a bit better sense of her. Um, and then I went to the archives at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, where Teller's letters are, where, where Teller's archive is, and there was only one letter, and it just said, you know, thank you for the manuscript. Um, 
And it was very sad because I'm, I bet those letters, I bet she did write letters. In fact, it, it, he refers to letters in her, in his letters to her, he refers to her letters and yet uh, we'll never be able to see them because obviously he was more interested in not showing who he was with respect to her. And I wish, really wish he had. Um, so I just um, wanted to say that uh, that was what much of what Maria Gephardt Mayer did and her life was pretty amazing. She was able to do intensely physics the whole time. Um, I, I wasn't really interested in atoms uh, when I was young. They were just too big. And um, I, why do I have this picture here? Oh, well, this is many, when you're young, you have many ideas of who you are. And um, I was sort of caught between um, being a cowboy, um, like these two young cowhands, um, and um, a Chinese poet from the 16th century. <laughs> and somehow it seemed to me that with those two things together, you could imagine um, being more interested in the vacuum or the world with nothing in it. So uh, we had um, particle physicists had big dreams. Um, we wanted to really understand the entire world, all the particles, all the forces, and in the CERN, in, which is a place in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, in 1954, they started to dig uh, for the first proton accelerator there. And I just love this picture because this is obviously very um, European, of course, because of the beret, but there's two men watching as the, they start digging for the proton synchrotron the beginning of CERN, this was just after the war. And then I showed, this is a stock photo and I showed it many, many times, but it wasn't until maybe about seven years ago that I noticed these two guys here who were almost the same as these two, but just in front, it's very odd. You can sort of see them there. Um, and uh, I don't know, I don't know what was going on here, but it was, this is one of the most interesting photographs. It's sort of like a photograph of a, painting by Caspar David Friedrich, where uh, there's always somebody, you see the back of his head and he's looking out at the, at the beautiful landscape. Um, okay, so at CERN, we started to build a proton accelerator, just one proton. But um, in Italy, there was a, a man, um, if, you, if we wanted to figure out what was inside protons and inside nucleuses, uh, we needed particle accelerators. So, he, he decided that he was going to make a collider, um, not just take protons and hit them against the target, but actually uh, take, for instance, in this case, a photon, uh, put it through a little bit of, of uh, metal, make an electron and positron, and then collide the electron and positron. And this was a man made, made named Bruno Trucek, and it was the first idea of the collider. And the thing I like most about this, um, is what he wrote. He was kind of also an intensely wild guy. Um, and he said, uh, the following is a very sketchy proposal for the construction of a storage ring. There's, those are storing these um, particles to collide. No literature has been consulted in its preparation since this invariably slows down progress in the first stage. Um, I shall present you here all I have thought about it and much which others have suggested to me and to anticipate the question no I have not properly read O'Neill so I I'm, I show this only to show that during this time people still had in really interesting personalities so since uh, CERN started um, and Bruno Tuchek came up with the idea of a collider actually there were a few people before him technically uh, but he made the first one um, we have found that there are quarks. These are particles that, uh, the, the most elementary particles, um, and they make up the atoms. Um, and there are leptons. This is the electrons, the muons, et cetera, and the neutrinos, which we finally found. And uh, there's a thing called the Higgs boson, which we found recently. And there are all the, um, there are all the things that make the forces happen. The, things that are exchanged between particles. So 
at the LHC, we collide protons now um, every 25 nanoseconds for about six months of the year. And when we're colliding protons, it's like we're colliding a bunch of quarks because um, they, they're, not, they're not very well bound inside the proton. And we can make then, we can collide quarks and gluons and we can pretty much make anything happen that we want unless, it's, um, unless it can't happen because of some kind of symmetry. So this is what we do, and this takes a long time. This is where it happens. This is the, uh, those are the Alps, and that's a lake. <laughs> and Geneva is just here, uh, where the, the lake has the jet d'eau. And underground, about 100 meters under this red line is our accelerator, uh, where we collide these particles. But I'm not, I don't wanna to talk too much about that. We had to build a detector uh, in order to, once we collide these particles, in order to see what comes out. And just to give you some sense of scale, the protons collide in here, and these are humans here. So when you go up in the lift aloft to work on some piece of equipment here, you really can't be scared of heights. This is five stories. And what happens when um, particles, the protons collide in the middle is that all kinds of particles come out and we try and figure out what they are. Are they electrons? Are they photons? Whatever. So this is what actually happens. Um, our whole detector is immersed in a magnetic field. And when a charged particle goes through a magnetic field, it bends so we can measure the momentum. So this is the kind of uh, event that happens. Many particles come out. We can take each one and we can measure the momentum. Uh, and um, we can measure its energy. Um, but what if there's a particle that we make that lasts a long time, so we don't see it except as the particle itself? So um, let's see. So we're interested in uh, many things, but we're most interested in um, right now how long particles last. So let me go here and say, sorry, I'm just gonna go backwards here. Let me go here and say, we have a lot of particles that we have discovered. In fact, we've discovered the top quark and the Higgs boson as Dean um, mentioned, and the W and Z particles. And we have all kinds of things like the electron and the proton and the neutron. And we put them on this kind of chart in which we say, this is the mass of the particle, the characteristic mass, and this is the lifetime of the particle or the average lifetime. And we see that, well, I'm just gonna show you some scary things. The top and the Higgs and the W and Z, these are great particles. Uh, they're very heavy mass, uh, like 100, roughly 100 proton masses. But they decay in about 10 to the minus 23 seconds. And you say, oh, well, I don't know what 10 to the minus 23 seconds is, how long is that? And I say, it's about as long as it takes light to travel across a proton. So it's really, really short. And honestly, I'm not a bad experimentalist, but there's no way I can measure 10 to the minus 23 second lifetime or really anything even down in this region down to about 10 to the minus 16. So, uh, so we think, well, there's particles though, like the neutron I said has a 17 minute lifetime. The proton never decays or neither does the electron. And we have these things called muons, which decay in two microseconds. So maybe there are some particles that have high mass and they have lifetimes that we can actually see. And you say to yourself, and so that's what I'm interested in right now. And you say to yourself, well, why? And I say, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be really, really great to have your proton-proton collision, collision, a lot of particles come out. And for each particle that comes out, can I tell what its lifetime and its mass is? Would, wouldn't that be great? So if a particle lasts just a little bit of time, I can still um, measure its lifetime and its mass. So I would like to be able to do that. Right now, we're not able to do that. Um, right now, this is, what this is sort of what it looks like. This is a picture here on the right-hand side looking end on in our experiment, these are all the particles that come out of one collision. 
And from this, we're supposed to <laughs> figure something out. If you look at sort of half end on, you can see this, uh, this picture, which is saying that when you collide protons together, you're not colliding one proton on one proton. Often you're colliding, often when you do it, 40 protons will collide with 40 other protons. So you have to figure out uh, what is happening. So if I wanted to look at every single track here and I wanted to say, what is its mass? It would be a very, very difficult thing to do. But that's, that's what I want to do. So when I say what it, I want to measure a lifetime, if a particle is, is moving, um, I can just see how long it actually lasts until it decays. That's one possibility. Um, or if I want to measure the mass, I could reconstruct these if I could find them and find the mass of this. I could, but there's another way, and this is the way that I'm very, we've just been working on. You can tell if a particle goes through a little piece of silicon, you can tell how much energy it should lose depending on its mass. So when a, when a particle goes through material, it loses energy due to ionization, you're knocking off electrons, and you can find its mass, which is interesting. So this is just a picture to say when this is the energy loss, the energy loss goes up if the, if the speed of the particle goes down. So for a very heavy particle, you think maybe the speed would be lower. So if we have a pretty fast particle, it has this much energy loss. But if we have a slow particle, it has a lot more. So could I tell just from how fast, how much energy it loses, what the mass of the particle is? And so we do this. So this is a look at our detector. And we see just at the beginning of our detector, we have a silicon detector. And we look for anomalous amounts of ionization, like too much ionization for normal particles. And that's what we do. And this is what we find. <laughs> we say, are there any particles which have too much energy loss? And what is their mass? And we have this plot, which seems very complicated. And I'm sorry about that, but it's actually what we see. This is the mass of the particle, which we can reconstruct from knowing um, the energy loss and the momentum of the particle. These black dots are the data and the blue, the blue is what we expect from everything else, things that aren't something new, just normal standard model particles. And what we see is a little bit of an excess here. And we are trying to understand that. We're not sure whether we can figure out um, whether it's just a mistake we're making with the detector or whether there's something new there. So uh, I wanted to um, uh, close by saying um, a while ago, I guess before the pandemic, I was in this uh, I was in this museum, which is in Oxford. It's a really nice museum. It smells a little bit like you know formaldehyde or something. But it's a very very beautiful building and a great museum. And it has this courtyard you can see here. And around the courtyard, it has all of these um, statues. And the statues, of course, I mean, one, one thing you do is you, you look at the statues and you think, oh, they're great. These are oh, that guy. Oh, yeah. And then you realize that all the statues are men. And then you think, oh, it's nice that they did all these nice things and discovered all this stuff. But then you think, isn't it sad that there were many, many thousands of years where women were not, or let's say not many, many thousands. Yeah, okay. We're not involved. We're not partners in, in this search for... Uh, how the universe works. And it just seemed really sad. So I thought about just coming, you know, breaking in um, later and just taking off one of the heads because who would really make just one guy who nobody really minds and putting on the head of Maria Gephardt Mayer. Um, of course, uh, I, did, I didn't do that. But I did want to say also that often physicists ask themselves, um, what am I doing? <laughs> For instance, uh, when I showed you the detector uh, that we use um, to look at proton-proton collisions, I told you it took a really long time to build, like about 15 years. And 
you can build just one little piece of that and you can ask yourself, you know, are you a physicist or what are you exactly? When, when are you being a physicist? At what, at what point in the day are you being a physicist? And this, uh, this I thought I used to think about a lot. And then at some point I realized something because I teach, I realized that, you know, you know how you have a lizard brain. That's the part of the brain, which is very old and um, it doesn't have anything. I think it's lizards have it. Um, and it, you know, you have lizard brain reactions to things. And there's also the monkey brain. I think this part of the brain, this is very technical neuro, neuroscience. <laughs> this is a part of the brain called the monkey brain. But as soon as you start studying physics and thinking about things like how long do things last and how far do things go and um, how fast are they and what are they and how do they affect each other, you start to have this little physics brain in your head, which I'm hoping to do some. Um, I hope we can do some studies with the MRIs. But what happens is physics students almost immediately start developing this physics brain. And I think that people are physicists as soon as this starts developing. There is some question about this part of the brain, whereas the lizard brain seems to be there in everyone. The physics brain, we don't know how long it lasts. So it's possible that you start developing your physics brain and then after 10 years it's gone away. But I think. I think I can now call myself a physicist because I'm pretty sure, and I, I keep checking that this is here, this part is here. And so I just wanted to tell you that for you who just who just heard this talk, it may be too late already. Um, you may be already starting to think like a physicist. So I welcome anybody who wants to call themselves a physicist because I think um, it's it's just about how you think and not what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was a very entertaining and, and wonderful talk. So I'm sure there are questions, but while we're waiting, um, I wanted to ask you how you developed your physics brain. What sort of got you hooked when you were young? Oh, um, yes. So I, I was, um, I, uh, in my uh, first year of university, I was not a very, very good student. Um, I hadn't really gone to high school, but um, I, I asked the person uh, I was studying um, quantum mechanics from, I said, uh, can I have a job at Fermilab? That's a, that's a lab, a, a, an accelerator lab just outside of Chicago. I said, can I get a job at Fermilab with you this summer? And he said, oh, we've already hired somebody. And I said, can I work for free for you at <laughs> this summer? And he said, yes. <laughs> but when I got to Fermilab, it was unbelievable. I mean, um, you know, talk about intensity. It was a place 20, going 24 hours a day, the accelerator, and you could stay up all night working on things and get up in the morning. It's on the prairie. So you see this incredibly beautiful uh, sunrise. And it just had an enormous number of people who were experts in very tiny little things. This is one of the things you find at, at um, accelerator laboratories. Behind any door is someone who knows something really interesting. And so it's, it's a con, all you have, like I spent a lot of the summer just knocking on doors or, or just not, actually not knocking, just opening the door. <laughs> and I loved it. And also I came from a family that was mostly, in, you know, in the head, everything was in the head. <laughs> not building things and and there I first got to drill into con concrete and drive a truck and a forklift and uh, build things at the same time um, as um, yeah as as I was able to also make calculations it's actually the best it, it is I think experimental physics and I'm just talking about experimental physics here is probably the best thing in the world <laughs> because especially for someone who gets bored easily because it's just so many different things that you do. Mm -hmm. I sound like I'm giving a, sound like I'm giving a, you know, an ad for particle <laughs> physics. Was there, was there a specific teacher or, or somebody that, that, that's initiated the spark or was it this um, in your life? Yeah, no, I did have a very good teacher. It was a draft dodger. Um, <laughs> A draft dodger. I came up to Canada to teach, and uh, an amazing teacher, really. Yes, um, a theorist, though. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I'm trying to think of the experiments. I mean, 
yeah. I mean, Fairmount is a place where people ride horses and get drunk. They're sort of like Maria Gephardt Mayer. Which I'm surprised. I, you know, she. I think she died before uh, Fairmount Lab started, but she would have fit in well there. Um, it was just a place of uh, many length scales. There were something happening on every length scale there. Yeah. Um, yeah, th there's a question from uh, from Catherine Hunt. Go ahead, Catherine. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first, a comment. I suspect that if you look at the time development of the physics brain, it starts to encroach on everything else, and it probably can't take over the lizard brain, but it probably does a pretty good job of filling up all the space. But my, my question is, I was intrigued by the Feynman diagram that showed Maria Gephardt Meyer um, working with the W particle, and my the W particle is that the W oh. just discovered yes. experimentally yes. about forty years ago, yes. and then I so, think of it as having as having been um, unified with electromagnetic theory in about the nineteen sixties. So yeah. I was wondering, did, was she working with the W particle explicitly in her? No, no, no. This is now our modern view of uh, what's happening in, in double beta decay. But Fermi's theory, the, 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 we didn't know the W yet. Um, yeah. We had a, a sort of an effective theory, which just said, uh -huh. um, all we knew was the neutron decayed into electron, uh, proton neutrino. But we imagined that, um, yes, she did not know there was a W. Yeah, the w yeah. I, I thought it must in 1982. have been. Yeah, yeah, this is my yeah. modern view, just in yeah, case that, anybody that totally makes sense. Modern, yeah. But yeah. it is true, she was not, she was really about atoms. And so by mm -hmm. 1960s, the 1960s, when, you know, we started to do a lot of, there was a lot of uh, quantum field theory. Um, she was, she was um, not doing that. So she was, not uh, that she was not yeah, doing it. Yeah. She was not involved in that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite stories about Maria Gephardt Meyer is that when she won the Nobel Prize, the San Diego newspapers carried a story with the headline, San Diego grandmother wins Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, one um, of the other things that I think is probably worth mentioning, because the younger people probably don't, I mean, younger than I am, probably don't have much experience of it at all. I believe that when Joseph uh, was, Joseph, Joseph Meyer was in uh, Johns Hopkins University, Maria could not be hired because of anti-nepotism rules. Yeah. No, she couldn't be hired anyway. It was not at Johns Hopkins, not at Chicago. Yeah. There was a rule that said that um, if your if your husband or wife had a job there, you couldn't have a job mm -hmm. there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, did, I, I don't really understand that, but I guess it had didn't. I, I think that rule maybe wasn't just for trying to get rid of wives, but um, maybe they didn't want whole mm -hmm. families working somewhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, like the the grandfather, yeah. the father, the son. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, thank you, uh, Melissa. There's a question from Einstein Dahlial. Uh, he's a freshman, uh, so he wanted some more information. Uh, if you don't mind, can you explain again as to why different things take different times to decay? Oh, um, well, yes, I can. Let's take the neutron, for instance. Where is the neutron? Is it up here? The neutron, for instance. Um, why does it take 17 minutes? So the neutron and the proton have almost the same mass. Okay, so there's not what, what we call, I guess, freshman. So it, it means that there's not a lot of possible momenta for the final state particle to, to come out because, because you know, the, the energy has to be conserved. So, um, so the fact that they have almost the same mass limits the lifetime, but also, what limits the lifetime is that this is what's called a weak interaction decay and it has to go through so it has to go through that w we were just talking about and whereas the neutron is one gv and the proton is just a little less the w particle the real w particle is 82 gv so it has to be it's it can happen but it has to be very unlikely there's some probability but it's very very small so both the fact that it's a weak interaction and the fact that the particles the neutron decays into are almost the same mass as the neutron are the reason that has a, lo a long lifetime. So the lifetime has something to do with how the particle decays. So again, the muon decays in, I said, two microseconds, and it decays because again, it is a weak 
interaction. It decays through this weak interaction through a W and the W is very massive. So a lot of what has to do with things having a different amount of time decaying is how they can, what they can decay into and through what force. Then there's some caveats, but that's basically what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. That, yeah. yeah, are there any other questions while we're waiting? Maybe I can ask a question. So on the long-lived particles that may escape detection, um, so would these be charged particles or are we talking neutral particles? <laughs> yes, yeah, so they have to be charged particles because if you want... So what we're doing is we're trying to see if uh, a particle will leave energy in a piece of material, like a piece of silica. And does it leave too much? That's how we're doing it. It turns out that that only happens by ionization and only charged, electrically charged particles ionize Mm -hmm. um, atoms. Because neutral particles just go by and say, hello, they just wave, (laughs) then they go by. Uh, But yeah, so they have to be charged, yeah. Okay, very good. All right, if there are no other questions, then um, wait, let me just, oh, there are, no, I I think we've covered them. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Melissa once again. Thank you, Melissa, so much for for coming. Um, If 